Anybody remember the parable before the wheat and tares? The sower. Okay, so the sower came out and he sowed seed, right? And there were four different types of ground and only one of the grounds that actually produced fruit. And it produced a very variable amount of fruit, right? 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, right? We said it was the same seed, though. So all things being equal, the seed should have produced 100-fold in every case. It had the ability in it. And what was the seed, according to the Bible? The Word of God. And now, do you remember what we said that really related to where did it find its fulfillment in uh, in prophecy in the kingdom of heaven beginning the the parables of the kingdom of heaven where did the sower fit in anybody Christ is the sower okay Christ is the sower remember we said that so the word what 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 Jesus is saying in these parables he starts out saying here's here's what I'm going to liken the kingdom of heaven to A sower goes out to sow the seed. And from the beginning, when God said, let there be light, the seed was going forth. Right? And so the seed will produce some 30, some 60, some 100 volt. In three out of four cases, it will die. It won't produce at all. Because that's just the world we live in. And so, when Jesus comes in his time frame, he's still still sowing the seed. In fact, it says the sower is the son of man. Okay, so he's still sowing the seed. He, He was sowing the seed all the way back in the beginning. In fact, Jesus, if you look in your Bible, Jesus is the creator of the universe. Now, not as Jesus the baby, like we, you know, every Christmas we want to think of Jesus as a baby, but that's not true. Jesus is not a baby anymore, right? And he wasn't a baby before he was born. Before he was born, he was, he was the Son of God, right? Second person of the, of the uh, Trinity. And he came into the world, but he was the creator. And he's been the one sowing the seed. But now the sower parable ends up with the bearing of fruit. Right? The next parable, the wheat and the tares, we have, in a similar situation, we have a planting of a seed. Does anybody remember what that seed was? In the wheat and the tares? What's the seed that was sown? It wasn't the word. In the first one, it was in the parable of the sower. He said he sowed the word. But then he sowed the children of the kingdom. What we said that that referred to is during, when the church began, the church age began, it was followed at first with people coming to be, be, coming into the church, right? And being born again. In the wheat and the tares, the sower is sowing, still Jesus, is sowing the good seed in his field, and the good seed is the children. And where do we see him sowing, not the word, but sowing the children of the kingdom? Shortly after the church began and people became, came into the kingdom, and, and, and you know, it was magnificent 3,000 here, 5,000 there, right? And it just kept going. But then persecution arose for the word's sake. In fact, the first parable said when the word goes out, persecution will come for the word's sake, right? We brought that out. Well, persecution meant 
when you turn up persecution to the nth degree, like you turn on your stove and you just turn up the flame, and that's probably a good illustration because a lot of them were burned at the stake. But you can almost see, you can almost remember the martyrs that were tortured. And we talked about Paul and in some of the scriptures where uh, it says that the uh, unless the seed goes into the ground and dies, it's not never going to uh, bring forth anything. It's got to die and come back to life, right? And then bear fruit. So he's now, before he was planting the word, then he's planting the children of the kingdom. But the parable of Deuteros said, but while men slept, somebody got in there and he planted his own children. That's what the parable says. He planted his own children and it was the devil. You're right. We should not Think it's strange in the church because where was the seed of the wicked one planted? Right next to the good seed. And you couldn't tell the difference. You couldn't tell the difference. At first. At first, until it matures and uh, the wise owner of the field when he was when when his servant said didn't we sow good seed into the ground and but where did these tares come from and he knew right away he said an enemy has done this but let's just let them grow up together they wanted to root up the the bad stuff he said no just just let it grow together now Laura knows all about rooting that stuff up because I help her in the garden and I'm always rooting up the wrong things okay yeah I mean she knows this is something I planted to me it's a weed and I go around with the, the weed spray and I kill her flowers that she just bought well, of course, there's no flower on there. It's just leaves. Well, there never will be. And there never will be, yeah. Keep that up, bro. <laughs> he says, let it grow up till the end at the harvest. He said, then I'm going to gather in the good grain into my storehouse or into my barn to the storage unit. But I'm going to gather the wicked tares to be bundled, to be burned. And then he tells us that that happens at the end of the age. So the next thing that happens, so we have the going forth of the word. This is God's explaining his whole plan here. The word goes forth. Then it produces, then he takes the the fruit and he begins to plant the children of God in the kingdom and they're giving their lives. Because what happened when the word went out and then it was planted in us and the word, did you know the word took on flesh? The word took on flesh when it came into you. If you are born again... The Word took on flesh. Your life is over. You're now born of bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh. So let's go to this. uh, You see the mustard seed here? You can see the the picture over here on the right, on the bottom. So we're going to Matthew chapter 13, 31 through 32. Is it safe to say, when we think about that period, when we think about when Jesus... Um, came off the mountain. He was talking to the disciples about um, pretty much, it is not your job. Let me do my job. Um, don't judge people. Meaning, don't choose, try to choose who is going to be saved or not saved or whatsoever. Right. Is it safe to say with us, our job is not to try to recognize who are believers and who are really not. Our job is to even you know, as the parable was saying, you know, we're going to be planted together with them no matter what. You know, and for us to just give the word and let the word work it. Yes, yeah, no, I think that's it. Use discernment, right? Yeah. Because he does want us to be, as uh, uh, 
smart as a serpent, as gentle as a dove. I think that there's times that you see things or things happen. You get to discern and say, you know, I'm not going to throw my pearl before the swine or trust this person in a leadership position because their 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 fruit's not good. You know, they're they're not they're part of the they, they may be a tear, and you don't want them coming in and teaching your church and that happens. Right. You have no you don't know though. You don't know you're gonna be all you know is wherever you're planted, there's gonna be some of the wicked ones planted next to you and you don't know who they are. Yeah, sometimes and you can't know. judge. That's why he yeah. says judge not. Your job is not to say, well, here, you know, this is going to be, I'll plan over here because this will, this is going to grow good over here. You don't, you don't know. You don't know one person from the next. You don't know who's, who's going to receive the gospel. But what did the wheat do as they were growing next to the terror? What did the wheat do? It just grew. It just grew. That's all you're supposed to do. Right. You are planted and you grow. You grow. And you produce fruit. Yeah. And that's what you, and who do you look you look to God for that. Okay, so let's go to this uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 31 through 32. So we understand we had the sower, then we had... And, and the whole thing is this, this prophecy of this, this concept called the kingdom of heaven. So we get to the third stage here in his teaching. He said, another parable... Put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. You notice here I have in green, indeed it's the least of all seeds. And this mustard seed, this mustard seed is, is uh, like it says here, it's, it's very small seed. Now, you might have uh, known people that actually grew mustard plants in their garden. How big is a mustard plant supposed to get? Look what happened to this. He said... It's the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree. That's not normal. That's wild. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were about 120. What do we have going on? We have, we had the sower, we had the tares, we have the children of the kingdom. Now he's talking about, he's, he, he plants this seed, and I believe it represents the outward or visible church. He plants it in the ground, is what, what's happening here. And we already were told that He's going to start it with the death of the martyrs, with the blood of the martyrs. That's what the church is going to be built on. And when we get into Acts, we can see the persecution and the blood of the martyrs. Remember Stephen the martyr. He was the first martyr. And it was the apostle Paul that that had him killed before he was the apostle Paul. And you could see the church was very insignificant in its beginning, wasn't it? But he's prophesying, he's showing us in the parable that it's not going to stay that way. It's going to begin to grow, but the enemy is going to come in and start tinkering around as well. And this thing is going to grow wild. It's going to grow massive. It's unnatural what is happening. But let's, let's see what the, uh, the beginning of the church as it's planted as a, the mustard seed. In Acts 1.15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were 120. How many people were initially planted into the church? 120. See the seed? 
It was a least of 120. And then, by the time Acts chapter 2, 41 says, then they gladly received Peter's word. They were baptized the same day. There were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And so you can see this, the herb is growing, right? The plant and this plant of heaven, this planting of the, of the kingdom is growing. And 3,000 people are added. The people that were planted, the people that were intended to be the children of God planted into the kingdom, they're not the ones that are considered the wisest ones. Or the greatest ones, or the cutest ones. They're the ones that recognize their need to depend on God. Did you ever notice that? The people who really get turned on for God, they know they need God. There may, be, there may be people out there that are doing it for other reasons, that want to be a part of it for other reasons. The true child of God, he's there for one purpose, or she. And that's to grow in God's kingdom. And so Paul brings that out because if you look around at the church today, who's the ones that are uh, out there calling all the shots in the church? You got your professors out there in the seminaries and a lot of them don't believe. They don't believe the word. Amen. You have professor, and then you got you got you got false prophets standing behind the pulpits. You got people mi- misleading, trying to combine different religions. And look what you got. Just if you want to think about the corruption, think think about Catholicism. How massive did Catholicism grow? This is what we're talking about. We're, we're not... We're, the tree that is growing here is Christendom. It's the visible, outward visible church. Not everyone in the visible church is actually in the church. Just like Paul said, not all who say they're Jews are Jews. Inwardly, right? It's the same thing in the church. But the ones who are controlling it, you got the Pope. You got the cardinals and the bishops and the, you got the professors and the, they're telling you you can't understand anything unless you go to their Bible college and their seminary. They're trying to take away the, your copy of the scripture so you can't understand it. And then they're filling up your Bible with footnotes saying you can't trust this and you can't trust that and you can't trust this. They're telling you that some of these parts of the Bible are not in fact, they just recently came out. The, the, the Pope actually came out and said, not everything in the Bible is true. Some of it's just myth. You can't count that on, on everything that's written in the Bible. This is why you need priests to help you. You can't just go out and read the Bible for yourself. What was wrong? What's wrong with you? Okay. Well, here's Paul actually addressed this in Corinthians. He said, for you, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29, he said, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. In other words, a lot, not many of you in the true church were wise in the flesh. Not many were mighty. Not many are noble. You see, you see a lot of people who, like I said, they need, they need help. That's why they're attracted to Jesus, because they need help. There's a lot of people out there that they, 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 they think that they got this world licked. They don't need God. Why don't they need God? Because they got all the money, they got all the friends, they got all their power, they got, they got great jobs, they got, right? And they don't need God. And when you feel like, you know, you start getting down in the dumps and you, you think, oh, I wish I, was, I had what they have. Maybe you shouldn't have what they have. Because maybe you'd get so cocky you wouldn't be here anymore. Because that's what happens. 
It says, not many of you were like that. God, because God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the, of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And here's a, a conclusion no flesh, that no flesh should glory in His presence. I don't care how rich you are. That's no reason for you to think you, that, you're gonna, that God thinks that anything great about you because you're, you're very wealthy. And a lot of these uh, ones who have been very successful, they don't even thank God for it. They think that they did it all by themselves. Some of them just inherited it from their parents. You know what? You, you didn't have any choice what, what womb you came out of. You didn't have any choice. You didn't have any choice what country you were going to be born in or what opportunities you would have. You know, some people are, 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 are born in, in, in a, uh, a home where their father and mother are able to set them up for life. Send them to the right schools, give them everything that they need, and and you say, "Wow, they have so much talent because they had all these musical lessons." And but you know what? God's not impressed with any of that because see, he did. If he wanted that, he could have. He could have chose that. He chose the base things, the scripture says. The base things and that which is despised. What God has chosen. But what have we done in the church? In the church, we look up to the successful people. You know what we want to be like? We want to be like that successful evangelist and bringing in millions of dollars. We want to plant our seed and we want to be millionaires. We want to be very successful at everything. But not many of us were meant to be that. Why don't we just trust in God? Your only purpose in life is to be who you were supposed to be. Not that you're supposed to be somebody else. Not all of us are supposed to be Billy Graham, right? Right? Let's look at that uh, parable again. Another parable put he forth unto them. This is the same one, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed which a man took, sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, earlier in the parable of the sower, you remember the first seed came out and it went on the wayside and something came down and ate the seed. What was it? A bird. And when Jesus interpreted it, he said, Satan comes immediately. What what he did was tie Satan and his demonic agencies to the birds. And now in this parable, he said, after, as you see, after there's this abnormal growth in the church, because remember, the tares have been planted. Satan knows what he's doing, and he's producing fruit, and God's producing fruit. Right? I plant, God plants the children of God. Satan plants the children of Satan in the same place. And so this grows abnormally. It becomes, it becomes a tree. It was never supposed to become a great big tree. The church started in little houses. People would meet in the house. Amen. Maybe a dozen people would meet. You didn't have to have a great big building. I mean, thank God we have these buildings, right? But that's not the way it began. Do you ever see these great big 
cathedrals. You go in some of these churches. Some people want to get married in, in uh, particular churches because they have they're they're so fancy, right? And they'll they'll rent. Say, how much can I? To, I'm not a member here, but I, I love all the you know the adornment. That's not the church. In fact, God says very clearly, the Spirit of God, He doesn't dwell in buildings made by hand, by man's hand. So you got the least of all seeds, the planting of the Lord, but when it is grown, it's the greatest among the herbs. The church, the greatest among the herbs, it certainly is. It's the greatest thing that God's ever done is the church, right? And it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. In other words, Jesus is saying here, the next phase of church history will mean the tares are going to grow up and the demons are going to come and invade the church. And they're going to be sitting, you know how, they're sitting up on the branches looking down like this, ready to swoop down on anybody in there. You can't run and hide from this stuff. It's there. And why is he telling that? He wants you to know what was going to happen. Because, you know, people looking around go, whoa, whoa, whatever happened? How, how did this happen? This is supposed to be God's church. It happened just like he said it was going to happen. Amen. Satan got in there and the birds came down, right? In, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. I think this uh, scripture prophetically is relevant that John the Baptist spoke. He said, and now also the axe is laid unto the the root of the trees. Now, are we talking about a tree? Were we talking about a tree and the, the mustard tree? The mustard tree grew, right? By the Spirit, John the Baptist says, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. There's a judgment coming with it. And therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So what's going to happen to this visible church? That's now infested with demons. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Just like he said, the the wheat's going to be gathered up into his barn. And the tares are going to be bundled together to be burned. And that whole thing, that whole tree that represents Christendom after the rapture, that's going into the fire. And that's why he says in the, se- in the seventh church, he, sa- he talks about Laodicea. He said, you are, you are not warm and you're not, you're not hot and you're not cold. You're lukewarm and I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And he throws them right into the lake of fire, doesn't he? Or into the tribulation. As there's like a similar time period we're talking about here. Like the Pergamus age is what we're talking about. As this tree is growing, as the the demons are beginning to infest and the evil's beginning to come into the visible church. And to the angel of the church, this is why you cannot... How many have ever heard the, the, the writings of the church fathers? Yeah, I got the writings of the church fathers at my house. I thought you, you have to have that stuff, right? You have to have it. Well, I found out later on that, you know, because I wonder, well, how, what makes these so great, these men so great? You know, where a lot of them were wealthy. They were wealthy, and they got prime locations and, and uh, positions because of their, they were born into the right place.
And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write to these things, saith he, which has a sharp sword with two edges. The sharp sword is the word of God, right? So coming out of his mouth, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Satan's seat, in context, you have the mustard, you have the mustard tree and you have the branches. Now you got it, they're loaded with demons, right? Where do you think Satan's seat is? He's right in the center of everything, right? And that's what Jesus is acknowledging here. Even where Satan seated, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed and to, to idols to commit forn- fornication, not only in the natural but spiritual fornication as well. Did all that happen in the church? It didn't happen in the beginning. But as the tares came in, and as the devil came in, and the demons came in, and then people began to worship idols right in the church. And that's how you got these churches with all these wonderful statues. And they bow down and they serve them, which is no different than Hindus. And what ma- it's worse because what makes it worse is they don't the Hindu they don't know any d- different. But the Christians, they have, the church has a copy of the Bible, which their leaders tell them you can't, you can't believe anyway. And they're sucked into this. And it's right here. Jesus warned us right here in the scripture. You have the people who hold strange doctrines, doctrine of Balaam. Balaam was a false prophet. In other words, you have in the church false doctrine because of false Prophets. When it talks about the demons infiltrating the church, it's to be understood that the demons can't do anything by themselves. They have to inhabit people. And when they inhabit people, they become false prophets. They become false ministers. And they begin speaking false words. So hast thou that held the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which I think I also hate, doctrine again, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So right there, Jesus said, repent, right? Do you see this here? And now the axe is laid unto the root. Of the trees, you, you, you see what he said? He, he just got through saying, if you don't repent, I will come quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And that goes along with John's, by the Spirit, prophesying the axe is going to be laid to the root of the tree. Now that, that's not going to happen while we're still here. The rapture will happen and then that will happen. He speaks about the next church age after Pergamos and it just keeps getting worse. Okay, it says, uh, And uh, the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith. Thy patience, thy works, and the last to be more than the first. He says works twice. Do you notice? I know your works. And then he names these other things, your charity and your faith and your service. And then and also your works. Twice he says works. Because in the church you're supposed to have good works. But good works don't save you. He says, even though you have these good works, he says, I know your works, and the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding. Or in other words, even though you have this good stuff, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. The woman represents false religion a false christianity in the end in the revelation chapter 17 she's going to be called babylon the great the great whore 
And that's what we see we, we, as, you, as you see the degradation and the corruption of the church. As, it, as a uh, mustard seed keeps growing, you have you suffer the woman Jezebel. Jezebel, is, she calls herself a prophetess. In other words, what do you have? False prophet. A, a prophetess is just a female prophet, right? right? Have we had our share of false prophets and false prophetesses? We've had, we've had uh, our share of women as well as men leading people astray. And look what she does to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed unto idols. Well, isn't that what he talked about last time? So it's still going on, only it's, it's going on like to the nth degree. It's getting worse. Now look what he says, I gave her space to repent. When he talks about this woman, when he talks about her, he's talking about the, the whole religious system, the false religious Christianity. I mean, let's just call it what it is. Eventually, Babylon the Great will consist of all religions. After the rapture, there will be one world religion. But when he talks to her now, when he's, he's talking about false, corrupt, the corruption of Christianity, the false visible church out there, and the false prophets out there, And he says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then that commit adultery with her in great tribulation. Isn't that what we said? You're going to have the rapture, then great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Well, they better repent before it's too late. And look at verse 23. I mean, I don't know how clearer you can get. I will kill her children with death. This is a judgment of God. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now, you, you, now do you see the axe is laid to the root of the tree and the tree is going to be torn down? The tree, not all trees, the tree which brings not forth good fruit is torn down and cast into the fire. That's saying the same thing. As we read this, now this is Daniel's Old Testament, but it, it sounds like Daniel's talking about the same thing. Daniel chapter 4, verse 20 through 23. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation." Sound like that same tree, although he's added another thing, another, another fact. What's that fact? There's not only the demons on the branches, there's the beasts underneath. And the trees, the, the church, the false church with its leaves and its branches are providing shade for the beasts of the field to come. When he's talking beasts, he's not talking little lambs. Wolves and bears and lions and tigers and oh my. The tree that thou sawest which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all under which the beast of the field dwell, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven, and thy dominion is to the end of the earth. Who do you think he's talking about? Remember Satan cometh immediately? Do you know the scripture says that Satan is the god of this world? He's the prince of the power of the air. 
Who owns the earth? Did you know Jesus hasn't claimed the earth yet? Satan's got the earth. He stole it from Adam. People say, oh, I don't believe in God because look at all these things that happen. God's not in, I mean, it, it, this is not God running things here. Satan has the throne. We just got through seeing. I know where you are, where Satan's seat is. Right in the midst of you is Satan's throne. Right in the church are the tares. Right on the, 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 the branches are the, are the demons. Underneath the branches and the leaves, in the shade, are the beasts of the earth. Just waiting to tear up the little lambs. That's the picture he paints about the church. And he talks here straight to the king. He says, O oh, king, you are grown and become strong. And their greatness has grown. Remember I said that, that mustard tree that was abnormal. It was abnormal, abnormally wild tree. It was supposed to be a little plant. And reaches unto heaven thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it. Yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This looks like Hebrew, but it's not. It's actually Aramaic. This is an Aramaic word, and this is an Aramaic word. It's, you pronounce it the same way, this would be Shiva Ididane. What it means is seven times. The reason it's interesting is that it occurs five times in the book of Daniel in Aramaic. In one time it, it, it it's just says seven and meaning implied seven times it separates in biblical numerology a five is separated with four as four plus one it's exactly how it appears it you got one that's different than the other four the other four occurrences are talking about the end times and it stands out because we know Daniel was talking about the end times. And if you're interested, we did a, there is a video out there on YouTube that we did uh, about the seven times. When we talk about Revelation, the seven times is really important. It comes up over and over and over about end time prophecy. And so if this scripture by the Spirit is, is, a, is associated with this mustard tree, which we can clearly see that it is, then he's saying that in the end times. So we're not pulling this out of context at all. This mustard tree and the final growth of it must apply to the, the last seven years. The seven times, the seven years. By the way, when Daniel was speaking, he was speaking to the king of Babylon. The Antichrist will be the king of Babylon. The false religion will be Babylon the Great. Right? It's not a coincidence. Here we see the man standing there with this wild... This is actually a mustard tree. This is what will happen if you let the thing go wild. Okay, but what did, what did the scripture tell us? You see these coming; those it, the Bible says foul. Well, what kind of foul looks like that? <laughs> huh? Foul. Those are foul, foul. <laughs> uh, the reason I have that like that is to bring out the foul are demonic spirits, and that's exactly what he's talking about. In that parable, we zoomed in there. You can see the. They look like little dragons, don't they? 
we have the next parable and it's like the next level of this revelation. So we've had the sower, we have the tares, then we've got the, the, uh, this world church, the visible, uh, the outward church growing up with the wheat and the tares in it and the demons and the beasts. And then we have another revelation. It says, in a parable, another parable, he said, the kingdom of heaven, uh, heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. Do you want to tell them how, you, how the leaven takes over? Um, that's not like yeast. It's like a fermentation. So you put a rotten apple and a huge barrel of apples, and is it long until every apple is rotten? All it has to do is touch the other apple, it rots, then it touches another, and it, it rots. And it's all fermentation. It's all fermentation. See, this is the next phase. He's saying as, as this happens in the church, don't be surprised because it's, it's going to be like the leaven taken over. The leaven corrupting the meal, the true meal. You notice uh, she hid, the woman hid three measures of meal. She hid the leaven in three measures. <clears throat> she hid the leaven in three measures of meal. So you got three separate measures of meal. That's, it's important. The, the parable brings that out. And meal is bread, food. And the leaven is a contamination. And remember, we, we just got through talking in the last parable. We talked about the woman. Anybody remember her name? Jezebel. Jezebel. It's the same woman in this parable. He's talking about the same thing. He said, and if the woman represents, this, if the bad woman represents the false church, then who is going to be putting the leaven into the into the church? The organized church is going to be doing it. We can see that uh, in these next scriptures that leaven is a negative thing. In Matthew chapter sixteen, verse six through twelve. You see, then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Who were the Pharisees and the Sadducees? The Jewish, Jewish officers in the church. The religious leaders. Yes. Right? They were the religious leaders. And Jesus, Jesus equated their teaching as leaven. If you, in fact, if you, if you drop down, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but down there where it says uh, about uh, one, two-thirds of the way down, down, it says, How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? And then the apostles understood how he bade them not beware of leaven of bread, but of doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Remember, he, in, when we were speaking of the, the mustard tree, and we looked in Revela Revelation, and he was talking about the doctrine of the false prophets and the doctrine of the false prophetess. And now he's saying the leaven represents doctrine of the religious leaders. Not the good religious leaders, the false religious leaders. And you say, well, how could this happen? This is supposed to be Jesus. He's supposed to be in charge of the church. It's happening just like he said it would. It's all in the plan. I mean, can he stop it? Sure, he can stop it. But it, it needs to work itself out because what he's doing, we don't always understand. Why do bad things? We don't understand everything. But one thing we can believe is that if God is our father and he's done all that to save us, he's got good intentions. Whatever's going on in our life will, be, will, will work out for our good, our good. Mark chapter 8. 
talks about leaven again. He says, he charged them. He charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Who's Herod? Herod was the king. Remember the king in, in, in Jesus' day? And Jesus said, be, beware of the, 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 the teaching of Herod. There were people who worshipped Herod as God. And they were called the Herodians. So there was another religious sect called the Herodians. He said, beware of them too. It's false doctrine. So in other words, what he's saying is everywhere you look, there's going to be false doctrine. What's the only remedy to false doctrine? You got it right here. This is the only way you can know the fall. It, see, it's not what I think. It's not what you think. It's what God says. It may sound good. I'm telling you, I've listened to some of these guys. You listen to some of these television preachers. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm just saying you listen to some of them and they sound so good. But there's just a little twist, a little... Well, one thing, they're after your wallet. I mean, let's just get plain. I mean, that... And they reason among themselves, saying, is because we have no bread. Jesus said, why reason? Because you have no bread. Perceive ye not, neither understand. Have you your heart? Uh, have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, you see not. And ears, you hear not. And you do not remember... When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said unto him, and went, um, unto him twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said seven. And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? So basically, he's saying the same thing there in another way. He's saying it's it's the, the leaven is like the false doctrine, right? And just like Laura said, the purpose of the leaven is to corrupt. And just like she talked about in a a, uh, basket of apples, if you got one bad apple right there on the bottom, it can ruin them all. Have you ever had that happen in your refrigerator? I mean, it shouldn't. You should be using it, but it does. Especially if you go on vacation, you know, you come back and you got something growing in your refrigerator. Like you're protecting the thing to grow. 2 Timothy 4 3. Here's the answer Paul says, Preach the word. Preach the. What is the thing that will solve or fight a war against false doctrine? The word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Re- reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, does this next part sound like the day in which we live? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned to fables. I don't understand how people can believe some of the fables that they believe. And they turn away from God's precious word, which is the truth. And they believe all kinds of goofy things. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This know also that in the last days, how many, I'm sure you've heard this this, uh, taught many times. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Does this sound like our time? Listen, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers. What's a truce breaker? Covenant breaker. What about the marriage covenant? Did you know there's more divorce in the church than outside the church? False accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good traitors, any high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 
Wow, that, that last part, all you got to do is look around. All you got to do is come to church. Amen. What do people love? Do they love coming to hear the word? No, they come. They, the lovers of their own self, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. In other words, they have this form of religion. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. He's talking about the same thing we've been talking about, right? This planting of Satan growing up right in the midst of the children of God. For of this sort... They are, the, uh, are they that creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins. In other words, make you feel guilty. These people are art, they're artists at making people feel guilty to get their money out of them. Somehow thinking if I give to this preacher, then I won't, you know, I'm going to be a good person. Don't you don't give money to anything because you feel guilty. Go to God, get rid of the guilt. Don't let that drive you. If, if, if you want to give, if you want to support a ministry, that's fine. That's great. That's a good thing to do. But don't do it out of guilt. Don't let them shame you into it. They're led. He said that they, they're laden with sins and led away with divers' lusts. The word divers, it's not scuba divers. Divers is many. It's like much. Many different forms, many different kinds of lusts. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. How many know people like that? They go to church. They're ever learning, but they never come to the truth. As Janus and John Brace withstood Moses, they withstood him in the time. Remember when he went to Pharaoh? They were the uh, Janus and John Bray were the um, priests that threw down their staff. They became serpents. If you remember the story, as they withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Second Peter chapter two, verse one through nine. Does this sound like our time? But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbers not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and he spared not the old world, but he saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterwards should live godly, and he delivered judgment lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for the righteous man dwelling among them is seeing and hearing vexes righteous so from day to day with their unlawful deeds the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished and that's exactly what he was talking about the tares will be bundled to be burned And these people that think, well, you know, God's not really going to do that. That don't sound like that Jesus who says, turn the other cheek. That don't sound like that Jesus who says, "Uh, does anyone condemn you? Well, neither do I condemn you. That first Jesus, he came as the Savior. The second Jesus, he's coming to execute judgment. He's coming to get his church. And then he's coming for judgment. He's coming as a king. Do you think that if he he didn't spare 
Sodom and Gomorrah and he didn't spend, uh, spare Noah and he didn't spare those angels that sinned and he threw them into uh, eternal fire. Do you think he's going to spare the world? He's not. It doesn't matter what some of these... Remember, the, the key word is false prophets. They tell you everything's going to be all right. Everything's not going to be all right. They're false. Read your Bible. Look at this parable again. Another parable spake he unto the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman, woman took and hid in three measures of the meal till the whole was leavened. The corruption is coming in the... Fo- Remember, the corruption is false doctrine, right? We've seen that over... He said the, 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 the teaching of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians. It's false doctrine. It's false teaching by false prophets. The women, woman is the false apostate church. She's hiding leaven into the meal. And here's how it's being done. Remember, I've been telling you about the translations and the corruption of the translations. There are thousands of manuscript. And when you got the King James Bible, you have, you have a different Bible than the rest of these Bibles. Because the rest of the Bibles today, they are completely ignoring the thousands of manuscripts. And there's three that they've chosen. The first one's called the Codex Vaticanus. What does Vaticanus sound like? Vatican. Do you know historically the Vatican has always been been against people having the Bible in their own language? The Vaticanus is uh, Latin. The Catholic Church would say the Codex Vaticanus was the most accurate in the oldest record of the scriptures. That's not true. Codex Alexandrinus. All of the false teaching of the Gnostic religion, all of the false writings that, that they, they, they claim to be... Um, they were called apocryphal writings that circulated among the church. They were all coming from Alexandria, Egypt. When did God ever tell us to go to Egypt for the truth? That's the, that's the second one. Codex Alexandrinus. And for a while, these are the two. These were the main ones. And then just in 1844, right around there, they come out with the Sinaiticus. Now, I've looked into this uh, somewhat, not an expert on any of this, but Sinaiticus, to me, it looks like it could be complete fraud. It didn't come around, the guy didn't find it until 1844. The Catholic Church, by the way, I believe, has come and said the Sinaiticus is the most accurate of all of them. The Catholic Church has gotten all of the denominations in the Christian Church and all of the Bible societies that are publishing the Bibles to agree that we're only going to look at these manuscripts. When we, when we make new Bible translations, they're going to come from these these are the ones, you know, when you look in your footnotes in your Bible. If you, you, you want to you see what I'm talking about, go to your Bible and look at um, uh, in Mark. Look at the last chapter of Mark, Mark. You'll find it. It's got about 10 verses and then there's a footnote that says, or, or you may have a footnote, you may not even have the rest of the verses. But those, those verses are deleted from a lot of these new translations. Now, you're going to find it in the King James. But you may, depending on what King James you have, you may even have a footnote in the King James. Okay, so it goes through 20. 
Okay, I don't have the footnote in my Bible, so I don't know. But here's the part that they removed from the Bible. Because it's not in any one of those three. They, they, in the new translations, they remove, Go ye into all the, or, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that is damned, he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's in the New King James. Is there a footnote, though? No. There's no foot. In a lot of the new translations, they've, and this is just one example. If you were the devil, wouldn't you want to get rid of that? These three codexes have resulted in 8,000 changes to the Greek that this Bible came from. You want to see this? You can, you can look this up on the internet. You probably can see some of these original manuscripts right on, uh, right on, the, right on the internet. Just write them down and look them up. Yeah, so it's got the Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, and uh, 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 Sinaiticus. And then there's, there's something else tied to this because along with what they're doing you also see that this parable about the leaven in many of your translations it says yeast we have bread here which you know bread is meal now here what what you have is you you have leaven and the leaven you can see the you see the leaven here now, this is just an illustration. The leaven don't really look like that. But you've got this leaven in here, and it's beginning to corrupt, completely corrupt the bread. So you can look at it like poison or like bugs, if you want, or like little demons, if you want to look at it like that. And the word here in Hebrew is sore, which perhaps... Uh, is very related to sour. Sourdough. Sourdough bread. Right. But the, the Hebrew word is suor, which reminds you of sourdough. There is no way that this Hebrew word was ever yeast. However, in the Greek... Zumne, ooh, zumne can be yeast or leaven or leaven. So it's not an in, it's not incorrect to translate the word to yeast if you don't care about the Hebrew. See the King James in the Old Testament they went to the Hebrew. And they paid attention to all the customs. It's a Jewish book. If you want to know what it was, then go back and look at the Jewish book, right? Look at the Hebrew. But you'll see a lot of these new translations, they're, they're bringing forth yeast. This is because they're using the... There's a fourth problem here. Is a, is a, another codex called the, the uh, Septuagint. What the Septuagint is, is they say that the uh, uh, Old Testament was translated into Greek. And it was accepted by all the Jews in all the world as a valid copy and the greatest copy of the script, the Old Testament. Now think about this. Does this make sense? Do you think God would have taken Israel and the priesthood was still in existence and the Levites who were entrusted with the preservation of his words. Only the, only the Levites, priests, had authority as scribes with the word of God Do you think he just defaulted it over to Egypt? 
so that they could make the Septuagint, supposedly in Alexandria, Egypt, about Two, two to three hundred years, about 280 B.C. before Christ. And the professors in, in, in the Bible colleges and seminaries will tell you that this is the Bible, the Septuagint is the Bible or the Old Testament that the early church used and that, the, that Jesus used and that the apostles used and there's absolutely no evidence that it was ever in existence before about 50 A.D. So they're basic, They're saying that these are the best manuscripts. Those three I mentioned before, and then the Septuagint for the Old Testament. And you can see the corruption happening right before your eyes in these new translations by using the word yeast, because you cannot go to the Hebrew and find the word yeast. If you've ever made bread, you know you can't just stick the yeast in the middle and it'll, so it'll leaven the whole thing. It won't work. It won't, yeah. It's it not, to, yeast is not leaven. It has to be the sourdough, the ferment, ferment, fermentation type of leaven that you make sourdough bread or friendship cake with. You take a little piece that's left over, you put it in, the, uh, and it ferments the whole thing, and it rises from the gas that's making the fermentation. It's not the same thing as yeast, which is a living organism. There's no way this corruption could take place unless these scholars, these supposed scholars, were ignoring the Hebrew writings and and accepting the Greek Septuagint. Because from there it's in Greek and then the word can be translated yeast or leaven. And that's how it got in there. See, I've spoken on this before, but I did not understand all this. This is this is recent recently has come to me that this is this is what this is all about that's why he used the word leaven because it's the perfect example about the corruption that's happening in the scriptures in fact you know in the book of revelation where it talks about the two witnesses and it says the two witnesses will be killed by the by the the um, antichrist and their dead bodies will be there three days and three nights. Well, we, we did speak on it. The two witnesses are individuals, but they also represent the two witnesses. The Old Testament and the New Testament. According to the prophecy, the devil's going to try to kill the Word of God. But it does say they will lay dead for three and a half days or for a period of time. Now, the good news is there are people that are waking up and are speaking out against this. But I don't I don't think it's going to change anything because all the Bible translators, they've all agreed with the Catholic Church. This is the way they're going. This is what they're teaching in the Bible schools. This is what they're teaching in the seminaries. The pastor, the, the Jesuits are infiltrating the, the pulpits all across America, all of, throughout the world. It's happening right in front of your eyes. I'm, I'm here as a witness to tell you what's happening because I know you don't see it. But I can see it. And this is what's occurring. A word is talking about their pernicious teaching and their pernicious ways. Do you know what pernicious means? Mm-hmm. Deadly. There's an anemia that you get that makes you tired. There's pernicious anemia that kills you. And that's what that means. And that word divers that you would call divers, that's just another way of saying diverse. Many. many right. Different kinds. Many. Much. much yeah. I didn't want to interrupt for you. Okay. <laughs> If you say diverse or different. Yeah. And so like she's saying, equating to this leaven, equating to the attack, you see what Jesus has done with the parable? He's taken, he started out with the sower, then he gets into the tares and the wheat, then we talked about the mustard seed, and now we're talking about the corruption of the word, the, the, the meal. You're, what is the bread from heaven? 
It's the Word of God. And Jesus laid all this out from the beginning. He said, here is the kingdom of heaven is like. In other words, this is how it's going to run its course. And so you can see as one gets compounded upon the other and the next and the next and the next and this whole kingdom of heaven, all this group of parables all talk about this same scenario, only taking it to another level. Taking it to another level. The mustard plant, they called it an herb. Herbs don't usually grow but about this big. The mustard plant grows great big like a spinach or a collard grain. So it is the biggest of all the herbs, but we don't use it like herbs except to make mustard out of the seeds. Yeah. But the mustard plant, you eat, you know, we eat it in the south, oh, you're not in the south, eat it, eat it, or greens, he won't eat them. <laughs> But the way that grows wild is, that's not right. See, there's something wrong with that. And that's how it's used in the, in, the, in the parable, is that it's like this monstrosity growing. And it, it, it would be great if it was the kingdom of God and it just represented the kingdom was going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And it sounds good until you realize the devil's inside. What is just that phrase, the devil's in the details? Okay. Yes. I'm beginning back here somewhere. We're talking about uh, bearing fruit. And we're supposed to, the seed grows, and we're supposed to bear fruit? What's that? Okay. When the word comes forth, the word being the word of God, the word of God produces fruit. The fruit it produces is the children of the kingdom. Okay? So now once you have the now the children of the kingdom which were that come from see the word comes forth and it produces fruit in your heart. And it transforms you and then your life is then taken to the next level and you are planted in the next field. It says the children of the kingdom are planted and that's why he said to count your life as, as dead so you can be planted in the kingdom but the enemy is planting his children in there also.